So, hi everyone. I'm Aimone Bodini. I'm a VR creator. And I just, I just want to thank you, the, all the organization, the staff of Voxel Belgrade. I'm very grateful to be here today. And uh, my speech will be uh, slightly different to, from what you have seen uh, in these days at Voxel Belgrade because I came from a filmmaking background, so I'm not a geek at tech guy. Um, I've been fascinated by VR two years ago because I, I saw in VR not just uh, cutting-edge technology, but also a medium, a medium to tell stories, to convey emotions. And uh, to the, uh, as you can see, narrative language of virtual reality is also my thesis, my thesis that um, I wrote uh, last year. And to do uh, a different job, I wanted a hands-on experience. I wanted to do a work experience, so I went to the United States for uh, an internship of a couple of months in a VR studio uh, called uh, Bully Entertainment. And I want to thank you also my colleagues at Bully because I've learned a lot from them. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to write my thesis and to do a work that's not just reading books and, and just that. So, Let's start. A long shot. A full shot. An American shot. A medium shot. A close-up. We all know the difference between these shots because we are simply used to them. We are all born with these B-dimensional images all around us, uh, movies, uh, videos, um, TV, advertising. So we know what's the difference. We know what, they, what these images, what these kind of shots want, want to convey us. But it's different for VR. What's VR? VR is, uh, from a medium standpoint, is a completely unknown path. We don't know much about VR. The hardware is still, um, it, it's, 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 we, we, are, we get not the final hardware yet. We are still developing a lot of technologies. So even for contents, even for um, games, uh, documentaries, and VR contents, it's very, um, it's, it's not mature yet. By the way, what's virtual reality? Uh, the author and educator, Michael Lyme, defined virtual reality as an event or entity that is really in effect, but not in fact. I think that this is a pretty clear um, quote, a pretty clear way to define VR, but many people still uh, compare VR to the 3D glasses used to watch traditional movies in theaters. And that's something that makes me very angry because um, let's, I, I, I'll tell you why. Let's think about the concept of frame. This is a traditional photo and we based um, paintings and photography and cinema are all based by this concept, the concept of frame, a subject enclosed in boundaries. This is Virtual reality, this is reality. As you can see, this is an equirectangular version of a 360 photo, but uh, the most revolutionary thing in VR is that you don't have the frame. The frame is gone. Mm, so I think that if VR is a medium capable to destroy a centenary concept as the frame, well, this is not, is not uh, like an accessory, like a plus, like those 3D Googles to watch traditional movies. It's something more, it's a new medium, because it's destroying something very radicated in, uh, in, in other art forms, like paintings and photography and cinema and so on. So this is also what uh, today Daniel uh, he got a speech on the lost medium. Daniel said that we have to be aware of the difference of 
an innovation and a, a technology innovation and a new medium because are two different things. And VR, okay, is uh, is um, a technology, okay, but it's also a VR medium. It's something that we can use to tell stories, to convey emotions. And this is my approach to VR. As I told you, it's not too technical. It's more on contents. On the other side, VR creators have to be av aware of what they are doing. For instance, I've seen many short films, many games that in VR that they, they have been ideated, they have been designed as uh, they would do with other traditional games for PC, for um, um, consoles. So the thing is that maybe if uh, cinema is called the seventh the seventh art, maybe virtual reality is the eighth. I don't know. The thing is that VR cr content creators should be, uh, should take uh, techniques, should take words from uh, the other media. Mm, I've I've compared many times the VR language with the cinematic language because I think that they are very close. But VR takes a lot also from architectures, from photography, drama, painting. So the thing is that VR creators uh, should ask, uh, should ask uh, the question twice before creating contents. For instance, mm, I want to replicate a dolly movement uh, in VR. I'm filming a 360 video. I want to move the camera, OK? And my audience will be, uh, will be moving as well. Uh, well. That's something that's not so so correct in my opinion because uh, there will be a difference between what your eyes are seeing and what your body feels in that moment. You are moving even if you are like this, looking around, if you are not moving. So there are words, there are techniques that are translatable directly. There are other words that need to be adjusted and other words that we can, we can translate at all. Okay, I've talked about a lot. I've talked a lot about awareness, about the VR language, but I'm gonna show me something. Mm, drive the user attention. I've told you about the absence of the frame, and this is something. It's something revolutionary. For instance, a lot of storytellers, a lot of film directors, are scared by this thing because the audience is immersed in a 360 space. How can you? Uh, be sure that your audience is looking uh, at something. How can you be sure um, you be sure the, that the audience is not missing something, a particular action of the main character? Mm. What we can use to drive user attention are both traditional tools like size, color, light, and graphic elements. These tools are already uh, are mainly used in traditional advertising, mm. but we can also use VR tools. With VR tools, I mean specific features of VR. Mm. The spatial audio. I can swear you that if you feel, uh, if, you, if, if you if you hear um, a sound behind you, you tend to look behind. It's something very strong. We are very sensitive to audio, to spatial audio. And this, this can be a tool to drive the, um, the spectator, the viewer. We are also very, um, mm, the character guys, uh, we also tend to look in the same direction of a character. For instance, if I'm looking, what's there? Many of you will just tur turn, you, you will turn your head and look behind. Mm. We got also diegetic UI. This is Metro uh, 2033. I don't know if anybody of you know the game, but this is a great game. It's for consoles and for PC. It's not for. It's not a VR game. But what's cool is that all the UI is integrated inside the game. And if we want to immerse the viewer uh, in the player in VR. Uh, we don't want to break the immersion. So UI is great uh, if it's diegetic. 
and movement. We are in a 360 space. Let's think about a scene where we are all surrounded by o static objects, and there is just one object moving. We tend to look uh, at this object in particular. We will uh, we'll follow the movement of this object. So these are, these are some tools we can use to drive, to control the user attention, but that's not enough. That's not enough because our um, viewer, our spectator, could be always look at somewhere else. So mm, there is another technique that's real-time storytelling, and this is the most technical <laughs> thing that I'll show you today. And this is a VR experience called Colosse. And uh, as you see, there is a graphic engine behind this experience that uh, is managing uh, all the events, um, and the user trigger uh, events. Uh, take a look at this. Uh, in a, during the experience, I hear um, a loud sound behind me. And I tend, as I told you, to look back. Uh, this sound is a giant colossus approaching us. And depending on where you are looking at on your left and on your right, you will see the first step of this giant colossus on your left and on your right. What I mean is that this is just a little uh, change, uh, but is a little example to, to, to explain you how real-time storytelling works. Uh, there is a graphic engine behind, and it reacts depending on your actions. Let's take a look about another, ex um, another example. That's, um, I got a castle, and I got a, water, a waterfall. Uh, the user, I, I'm looking more on this castle. And so the engine will recognize that I'm looking more at this castle, uh, then at the waterfall, and the story uh, will progress in this way. Um, the story will react uh, using the castle as um, as the, um, uh, uh, the the story will progress in this way. Maybe I'm interested to know what's who, who lives there, who lives inside the castle. Mm. It's um, it's great for uh, viewers. It's difficult for VR creators because you have to create, you have to build a lot of paths, a lot of stories. Um, but in this way, we'll, you will be always aware of where your, your, your viewer is looking at. Another tool, another technique that's great, that works great in VR is proxemics. Proxe proxemics is a discipline that uh, discovered and studied the anthropologist Edward Hall in the late 50s and 60s. And what he said that uh, depending on the distance we have with people, we have a different uh, relationship with them. For instance, if I'm very close to a friend of mine, if I'm very close, um, if I'm very close to another person that maybe is a friend, probably he is a friend of mine. If I'm very close to another person, probably he is my partner. On the other hand, in my, if I'm in a, pub in a public space, uh, I'll, I'll tend to, to have to keep a longer distance. So um, what does this have to do uh, with VR? VR, as I told you, is a sp um, immerse the viewer in a 360 space. And in most of the uh, VR experiences already out, Mm, we get the stereoscopic vision. So the stereoscopic vision will uh, uh, also embrace this, mm, the sense of depth. We will be uh, really uh, tricked that we get a third dimension. This is mm, an example of proxemics. This is Henry, is uh, an experience created by the Oculus Story Studio. This actually is only the trailer, but even in the trailer, they use these techniques. Harry is an edge dog, and as you can see, he's approaching us, he's coming towards us. What I feel, what I feel when Harry is approaching us, I feel a, cert, um, um, a sense of intimacy. Uh, I, I'm, I sense a sort of friendship with him. And in the same experience, Harry also 
steps back and do something like this. It closes. So the distance now is, is different, is, uh, is far away from us. And uh, mm, the emotions, the viewers, and I feel, w what I feel is I'm, I'm sad for Henry. I mean, so proxemics is something mm, also used in other of your experiences, like catatonics from uh, within. Within is the VR company that produced this short. As you can see, there is a sort of monster, there is a sort of bad character that is, is, is coming very close to you. And now the feeling you get is you are, in, you are uh, scared, you feel in danger. Mm, so the distance between uh, character um, between you and Carter is not depending; in, doesn't depend only on the distance you keep with them, but also by the nature of this character. This is another example: is clouds over Sidra, and you have just explored a refugee camp in Syria, and this is the end of the experience. And all these kids uh, comes all around you, and I can swear you that. A pretty strong feeling what you feel because you you, you see all those kids uh, very close to you so this is another very good use of proxemics and this is wave of grace mm, I was wondering as I told you uh, how can we translate the different shots in VR how can we recreate a close-up in VR and maybe Proxemics can be the solution. Maybe uh, to have a sort of close-up, you have to place the actor, the character, very close to you, as in this case. Let's talk about editing. Editing in VR. Mm, actually, I'm not totally conv convinced yet about editing in VR, because in real life, uh, you get a linear time. Mm, you live the present, past, present, and future. So if VR wants to recreate another reality, also it's not just the space that has to be real, but also the time. So I'm not totally convinced about cutting and editing in VR. I mean, there are, this uh, is the, um, this is uh, Memento. This is a film of Christopher by Christopher Nolan. And have you seen Memento? Some of you. You remember that it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy. And uh, can you do something like that in VR? I don't know. It <laughs> would be <laughs> mind blowing. It would be strange. Uh, as one Alfred Hitchcock said, "Drum is life with the dull beats cut." So. I'm aware, as content creators, as, story, as storytellers, I'm aware that I cannot, I, I have to cut boring parts or parts of the story that are not interesting for the viewer. Uh, so, what can I do? I think that we can use diegetic cut. What I mean with diegetic cuts is that, mm, for instance, in this case, this is um, a sketch made by a colleague of mine at Bully, Christopher Williams, for um, a VR experience I was developing with them. And in the end of this experience, you will approach this white light that becomes brighter and brighter until you get a sort of fade to white. And I think that this is a diegetic cut because you will cut uh, on, based on something related to the story. So it's the, the, the cut will be smooth. It's not something uh, shocking. Um, I don't know if you ever tried to look at, to watch 360 videos, but uh, you feel the cut in 360 videos, it's, it's much more shocking than in a, um, than um, when you, it's different when you are walk, well, watching a movie, when you are watching a TV or video, it's not so invasive is, as in VR. So this is another technique. This is a sort of 360 occlusion that's diegetic. There is this guy that is pulling on us a, a cloth and then cut. You can cut. So 
And this is another smart uh, idea to, to do a diegetic cut. This is a very experience created by um, Sightline called the chair. And this is, this is amazing because this uh, cut, uh, I, I call this rotational tracking cut. And what, what it does is using the um, rotational tracking technology inside the headset. And when you are looking, um, uh, let's, let's, let's assume that I'm looking here right now, then I want to look back, and then I want to look uh, here once again. What it did, the, um, the, there is a graphic engine, of course, behind this. And the, um, there will appear uh, objects that uh, were not in the scene before. So it's a smooth way that to, to, cut, to change the environment. And as I told you, um, we have to cut in a different way in VR. We should cut uh, and you should cut and let the user experience all the environment around. So we can cut every three seconds. Maybe we can cut every 15 or 20 seconds because the user is fascinated by what's around. He wants to explore. So a lot of 360 videos and VR experience out there just cuts. Uh, uh, the, the cuts are, uh, there are too many cuts and they cut too quickly. So we need to let them, we need to give the user time. Localiz localization of key, ev of key events. Mm, this is a uh, VR short film directed by Georgi Moldsov. It's his Russian, and my Russian is not uh, a great Russian. So, as you can see, uh, to help the viewers to um, to localize the, 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 the object, the, the main events of the scene, when uh, George cuts, he cuts and place the subject, plate, place the main action in the same position. This is a way to, um, to let the user, uh, to, 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 to be clear uh, to the user, to the viewer. Language and technology. Mm. I think also that language and technology are goes hand to end. Uh, they are uh, related, and in cinema, in the early centuries or even in the late 18th century, they were using very heavy and big cameras, and they placed these cameras on on the tripod. Uh, because they were too heavy, mm, so what you could uh, what you could have was just a static shot, and uh, so the language what you can convey to your viewers was was a static shot. What you can what you can convey with um, a static shot. On the other hand, in the late 50s and 60s, with the Nouvelle Vague, the French the French New Wave, uh, many directors. Uh, used um, these uh, 16 millimeters cameras that were very, very, um, very light, and they can. They started to move the camera a lot. They started to handheld the camera. Mm. In VR, this is we, the language, and, and it's the same language and technologies goes ends to ends because. For instance, let's think about the Samsung Gear VR. We got three degree of freedom. And with the Vive, for instance, we got six degree of freedom. So, uh, if I can move in the scene with the Vive, if I can move, mm, me as content creator, I have to create a different story. I have to create a different content, a different game, because I can move. I have to be aware of this, limit, uh, of this technology. If I got only three degrees of freedom, I have to be aware of this limitation when I'm game designing, when I'm doing this stuff. And this is the, the same with the fairy feral view. Sorry, but it is not, it's not correct. It's fairy feral. Fairy feral. And um, what I mean is that uh, there are already out headsets with uh, 
more than 200, 200 degrees of, of um, of, of follow fi the, the field of view is more than 200 degrees, and there are other headsets like the Gear VR that's 90, and the Oculus Rift, the C1 that's 110. Uh, what I mean is that if we place the content on our perifer peripheral vision, if we get a, a, a wider peripheral vision, we will we, we can play more with uh, the edges. We can play more uh, with this peripheral vision, and we can place uh, the object. This is Sisters. This is a mobile game. This is a VR experience for mobile. And it's great because it's uh, exploiting one of the features of VR, the peripheral vision. Uh, as you can see, if the television is on your, on your peripheral vision, um, you will see this face, but when you try to, to focus on it, when you try to put the television uh, right in front of you, this face will disappear. So you can play a lot with this. And this all depends by the technology adopted, rotational tracking, peripheral view, but a lot of other things. So when you are designing a, a game or a short film or whatever, you have to be aware of which technology you will use because different technologies have, have different languages and different potentials. So, uh, conclusions. I think that we are the same public that watched for the first time the arrival of a train at the Station in the 1895. Um, and uh, the story, the legend, says that wha when they, they saw for the first time this train coming towards them, they just woke up from their seats and esca escaped from the theaters. They ran away because they were scared that the, um, the train would crash them. So uh, today we are not more afraid of trains <laughs> coming in this direction. But what I mean is, what, what I want to what say is that we are not yet used to the VR medium. We will need time. And what I did with my research, with my thesis, what I'm doing today here is just a small piece of this giant puzzle. I've just uh, scratched the tip of the iceberg. What we need is uh, the, um, we need uh, other f professional figures, we, we need uh, architects, we need psychologists, anthropologists. This is as to be, uh, mm, uh, we, we need a common effort from multiple professional figures. So I think that if we want to push the VR medium forward, we need to collaborate. Thank you. Q&A, someone got a question or? What? Uh, what tools do you use to record these movies? Two? Tools. Like cameras? Well, uh, actually I'm developing a VR experience. Well, it's a 360 videos. And to create 360 video you use uh, a rig of GoPros for now. I mean, that's what I'm using right now because GoPros are very small and the parallax effect is minimized. So mm, you, you use something like three, six, uh, six GoPros and, with a, uh, and you place them as a dice, okay? And then you have to, do, you have to merge all these footage, all these images, you have to merge them with a the software, but there are a lot of, a lot of technical prog problems uh, about 360 videos, as I told you, for the parallax effect. And I can show you something later if you want about the parallax effect. And on the other hand, if you want to create a CGI experience, you can use, as I told you, graphic engine 
as Unity, you can work with uh, Maya, uh, Nuke, uh, Zeta Brush, and other tools to create CGI. Mm. Did I answer to your question pretty much? <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. I have a question about, let's say you're making a horror video game. How, how would you go about it? Would you make it to be as real as possible or would you make it not to seem to user that it's uh, real so that he doesn't get too scared? Uh, are you talking about a CGI experience or a live action experience? Something you create? Uh, a CGI. CGI. Well, the limitation right now is the hardware. Uh, in particular, with um, with uh, mobile, you can recreate a super realistic uh, scene uh, for other limitations. And your question was? Um, how would you go about it? Would you make it to be as real as possible or not so? <laughs> well, I, I can swear you that when I've tried Sisters, that was another game, I was scared <laughs> a lot. Because even if uh, the polygons, you know, the characters were not so realistic, but it's it's a new medium. We are not used to it, so you can scare, you can emotion the person even without doing something very realistic. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have right here. Oh. Uh, yeah, I have a question for you. So. Um, in the old movies, for example, you could point a camera at a thing and then just record it. But if a viewer has a degree of freedom, if I can look at a ceiling all the time, how would you like force the viewer to see what you want him to see if you want to make a movie? As I told you, this is one of the main concerns for film directors. Uh, you can mm, create a story based on where your viewer is looking at in that particular moment. So you're looking at the ceiling, the story will progress, will proceed in this direction. The ceiling uh, will have a particular role in the story. So you are creating a different story, uh, a new story. You get multiple uh, paths. It's real-time storytelling. Uh, you base the story on the viewer behavior. It's uh -huh. different from what we are used to. Uh, yeah, it's much more complex, basically. It's, it's very complex, but this is way. But uh, I agree with you. How can you be sure that your viewer is looking at what... Yeah, I can what, always what, look away, for example. Yeah, yeah. this is one of the main concerns. Uh, it's not just me, but uh, every content creator is um, trying to figure out how to solve this problem. Yeah, that seems like the biggest obstacle to this. Yeah. You, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah. My question is: um, In your personal opinion, do you um, foresee in the foreseeable future that um, some of the established directors will start using VR as a medium? You know, people like Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez, people like those. So do you think, it, yeah, do you think they, they will soon make like a full feature VR uh, movie? Well, actually Ridley Scott uh, did a piece uh, for, uh, you know, after the, the Martian, his feature film. He made also a 15 minutes experience, VR experience, that I didn't try it honestly, but he's not the only one. Today I've read about Inarito and uh, his director of photography, Lubetsky, they are working on a VR piece. Also Spielberg is working on something. Um, I think that these big names um, can, we will work, we will try, we will experiment at least uh, short film or experiences in VR. So it's something, it's something that is happening and um, the first People that will experiment will be these big names, George Lucas and Star Wars uh, for their last film. They did a lot of VR pieces, a lot of VR experiences. I don't know if probably wasn't Lucas in person, but a lot of, a lot of big names are moving to, to experiment at least. Okay, okay, thank you. I didn't know that.
do, do you think that VR will be accepted at the speed of which um, 3D films were accepted? So do you think that VR will develop as fast as 3D films de developed and actually get accepted into the mainstream theater, especially with Avatar? So what's the question? You are saying that the, the, the timing? Yeah. H how much will it take for VR? movies to get actually in the movie cinema? I don't know even if you will talk about VR movies because movies it's what's already there. I don't know if you will talk about VR movies or VR, VR experiences, experiences or whatever. Anyway, it will, will need time. I think that's... I, I can give you, uh, I can give you uh, a timeline. I can give you um, a number. Um, for sure, if these big names will move, if Hollywood and other big names, big companies will move, probably we'll see something in the next years. But I don't know, so, <laughs> honestly. So do you think that VR will have like a big experience? Like Avatar was for 3D, so Avatar really made 3D really popular in cinemas. Do you think VR will have like a big jump experience and just push it into the mainstream or move in with a few lesser pieces, so is it going to be one big jump or just a few smaller ones? Well, as every 3D, mm, every, as every 3D movie, mm, it's, uh, it's, it requires a lot of effort, so it depends. It's, it's not too difficult to create uh, 360 videos, I mean, it, I mean it not too difficult. What I mean is that I think that to create CGI experiences, yeah, we, you, you, you need a lot of uh, effort, it's expensive, you need a lot of uh, different skills, animator, um, uh, VFX artist, uh, so it will, will not be that easy. We will see which tools, which software uh, we will use in the future. Maybe it will be, will be very easy to recreate VR. Mm. Who knows? A lot of questions I'm, all, I'm still asking myself, so... Thank you. Okay. Nobody else? Thank you.